Hey, how are you? Is one, it's a good thing. Number two, it's proof that Christ is who he said he was. 
Uh, it's powerful and it's permanent. He did it once for all. I wrote my newsletter article this week about the word to tell us that it is finished. Christ has done it all for us. Uh, he died on that cross. He said he was going to die on the cross. But more importantly, he said he was going to rise uh, again in three days, and he did that. We're excited to celebrate with you this morning. Glad you're here. Let's worship together. Good morning, as Lisa said, we are so grateful that you are here to worship our risen Savior with us. And I just want to read um, this verse from 1 Peter uh, before we enter into worshiping God through song. For Peter writes, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Amen. Yes, Miss Betty. Amen, amen, amen. And that is why we worship not just on Easter Sunday, right? That's why we worship every Sunday together because we have a God who lives, a God who reigns, a God who is alive in us, a living hope in him that only came possible because of the resurrection. So Join as we sing these words that God so loved the world that he gave his son. As we worship him this morning, join us. Yeah. 
by choosing to humble yourself, put it on flesh, and choosing to be obedient even to death, so that we would not die. You, the eternal life that you have chosen to allow us to live with you for eternity. Thank you for just this moment where salvation isn't coming. The salvation has come. For you are faithful. For you did what you promised to do. By putting Satan in his place, by conquering death, by giving us redemption and being faithful to forgive us and giving us your grace. Thank you, Jesus. And the only appropriate response to that is to worship you, to bow down before you in humble adoration before your throne. And if you're feeling unworthy right now, if you are feeling shame and guilt right now, lift your head. For the lion of Judah, for the root of David, for the lamb that was slain has entered the room. And he is here. And he is calling you now to eternity. We can worship in freedom and truth. For eternity. Oh, Jesus, thank you. As we sing to you now, worship.
seated and invite you to find me a copy of God's Word and join me in an unusual place for us to deal with the Easter message, Colossians 1.27. I think you'll see when we get through this, probably halfway through, um, what God was up to in my heart this week in preparing for today's message. December 3rd, 1995 was the day that changed everything for me. Prior to that day, there was not one day that I did not wonder if I died when I go to heaven or hell. I wondered about that. In fact, every night when I put my head on the pillow, there was one verse that would run rampant in my thoughts. You could just hear the, the wheels squeaking in my head as I thought through Matthew 7, where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he made this statement. He said, there will come a time that many of those who said, Lord, Lord, to me, I will say, depart from me, I never do you. I feared facing Jesus and hearing those words every day. But December 3rd, everything changed. Everything changed. Now, here was one of the things that Jesus had said. I, I, I feared that I would, I would be cast into the place that Jesus referred to as prepared for the devil and his angels. What we typically refer to as hell. Now here's the key. When Jesus described that place, he didn't call it a place prepared for you or me. He said a place prepared for the devil and his angels. That means we were I don't know about you, but that's good news. Because that means I wasn't meant to go there, and it wasn't meant for me to go there. The day I was saved was a Sunday. I woke my wife and our kids, and I told them what had happened. For 22 years, I had no confidence whatsoever that I was saved or had around. In fact, after I told my pastor later that morning in his office, he asked me to share it with the congregation. Now, he asked if I would be afraid of that. I said, I have nothing to hide. For 22 years, I feared that somebody would discover that I was lost as a ball in high grass. Now, for, where, where's Bill Eagle? You understand that. <laughs> Golfing, losing a ball in high grass. Uh, you probably still got a few out there somewhere, I'm sure. But I felt like I was that guy. And that somebody would figure me out. They would read my mail and know that I was lost as a ball in high grass for 22 years. So I told my pastor, and he asked if I would share it. Now, here's the deal. Any time a staff member on, at a church gets saved, there are a lot of questions. There are a whole lot of questions. One of the first questions that I encountered after I had shared it that morning, I went to meet with our youth in their Sunday school area because we had an early service in Sunday school and then a, a, a later service. And so I went to meet with them, and the number one question was from those youth that I had led the faith in Christ. They asked, if you didn't know him, how do I know him? Because, you know, you couldn't introduce me to somebody you didn't know. You know, I, I said, well, here's the deal. You weren't saved based on my faith in Jesus. You were saved on, based on your faith. So that didn't mean that because I was lost all that time, they were lost. They had faith in God. The parents wanted to know the same thing. It's interesting. The deacons wanted to know a totally different question. They had one question the next day. If you've been, if you've been lost all this time, do you need to go pay back taxes? <laughs> I, I thought, boy, is that ever irrelevant. <laughs> but here was the deal. One, one young man came up to me after that first service. His name was Dwayne. You remember Dwayne? Dwayne was a handsome young man, single. Uh, he, he was an athlete. And uh, Dwayne came up to me and he asked me uh, how I knew for certain that I was saved. I had never referred to this scripture before, 
but it came immediately to my mind out of Romans 8, 16, where Paul said, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. There's no pretending in that. And here, here's the deal. That was the first time I had ever had that agreement inside me, that the Spirit himself had spoken to me and called me a child of God. I had never had that day. Down through the years, I've had hundreds of people ask me how I knew that Jesus was alive. And that's what we're here today to celebrate. They asked me how I knew that Jesus was alive. One thing is evidence of that truth. Look at the last seven words of our text. This isn't going to be all we're going to deal with. But look at the last seven words of Colossians 1.27. The last seven words say that Christ is in you is the hope of glory. The hope of glory is a reference to someday I'll see Jesus. That's glory. That's heaven. But what is the evidence? Christ in you. Now if Jesus wasn't alive, there's no way, just think through it, there's no way he could be in me if he wasn't alive. So if somebody asks me how I know Jesus I can tell them, well, he lives inside of me. They can't deny that because they don't see what's inside of me. But I know what's inside of me. And probably the look on my face, the next day I went to uh, a thrift store. Imagine that. I get saved one day and I go thrift shopping the next day. Well, anyway, I went to the thrift store the next day because the guy that managed it was a good friend, Keith, wasn't it? And, and I went there and I started seeing church members in the place, and no, I started seeing people from the community that hadn't heard what had happened. And one after another, they came up and said, what happened to you? <laughs> Here was my prayer that morning. God, I don't want people to see a difference in me. I don't want to have to tell them. I want to tell them, but I want them to see a difference. And they started coming up. They hadn't heard. I said, you haven't heard what happened yesterday. What happened yesterday? I said, I can say, really? Some of these guys we played softball with. And they said, it's about time you got saved. Uh, but that was the good news. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The first verse, uh, of the one verse by the Apostle Paul that is it's so loaded with powerful truths. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. One verse. This Easter Sunday morning, the last day of March, 2024. Look at verse 27. Paul said, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, for us, the title is My Hope of Glory. Not just the hope of glory, but my hope of glory. But Paul begins by saying to them, who is this to them that he's talking to? Look at the verse right before that, verse 26. Paul said that the mystery, he speaks about the mystery in verse 27, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. That's who he's speaking to. His saints. To them, God will to make known three things. Three things. First of all, the riches. The riches. Now consider the abundance of these riches. Most of the time, if you're told you inherited a million or you're in, you inherited a fortune, you're going to know how much. You know, riches. You want to know how much is there. The abundance of these riches. Think about it. A lot of people want to know what assurance you and I have that we are going to heaven one day. Here the main, here, here's the main assurance we have. The moment you and I put our faith in Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord, all of heaven, it was like a download. Y'all know what a download is. All the time. It was like a download. All of heaven came and dropped in my heart. There's no denying that it's real. That, that 
told them, don't get my anger to real. It was like a down payment. And the inheritance is the one day that I get to go to heaven and I get to see the place that was prepared for me. That's the inheritance. The down payment is when God drops heaven in my heart. That's when Jesus comes to live inside of me. Now, I love Paul's words in Philippians 4.19. He speaks again about the riches and glory. Look at, listen to what he says. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There's the riches and glory part again. Riches. According to part of the riches is an abundance that far exceeds any measurement that you and I can have and even imagine. Barnes Notes emphasizes that the, the word riches means his abundant fullness of his inexhausted, inexhaustible ability to supply their needs since he possesses everything. Everything. <coughs> he supplies our needs by the measure of his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, riches denote superfluity of what abounds or exceeds a man's natural desires. The word in the New Testament is used to denote abundance or what is extremely valuable and great. So we're going to let that sink in just a little bit, and we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to do this on the letter B in your outline, letter B. We're going to look at measuring the package. Now, I work at UPS. We measure packages. Can you get a little package? I work in the area called small sorts. Um, I deal with D bag. We empty bags and uh, or we unzip bags and we empty small packages. If anything comes to small sorts that's too big, it's called irregs, and we send it across the hallway or across the aisle to. <coughs> Revenue and they measure it. They send. They pack. They put a label on it and they send it down the line to your regs and they carry it out because it's too big for us to handle. So we deal with the size of packages and all that kind of stuff. Now here's the deal. Paul deals with the size of what's going on in our hearts. And the first thing he deals with: consider the depth of these riches. The depth. The depth. In 2015, a guy by the name of Joseph Matthias wrote a song based on Romans 11.33 that said, um, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment and unfathomable his ways. Unsearchable and unfathomable. Those are big words. The phrase that stands out to me is the depth of the riches because it relates to our text. The word depth in scripture is applied to anything that is vast and incomprehensible. Barnes Notes says that as the abyss of the uh, ocean is unfathomable, so the word comes to denote what words cannot express or what our minds cannot comprehend. That makes sense? That makes sense? So the depth here that we're talking about of the riches. Think for a minute about the depth of the wisdom of the knowledge of God in the fact that God knows our hearts and he knows that our hearts are sinful. He's not caught off guard. We cannot fool God. Y'all know that? We can't fool God. He knows our hearts. But here's the key. The wisdom that comprised a plan beyond comprehension for him to send his only begotten son to bear our sins and die in our place so that we can be forgiven. That's incomprehensible. There's no way I can fully understand why God would love me like that. That's the depths. I received the text this past week from a good friend that sends devotional texts every day. This one had the, the song Forever by Carrie Jones.
go in it. Here were some of the words. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness, a battle in the grave. The war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected king, hallelujah, has rendered you defeated. Then these words, forever he is glorified. Forever he is lifted high. Forever he is risen. He is alive. He is alive. If you believe that and you celebrate today, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good news. That's good news. I don't know if in a thousand forevers we'll, we will ever comprehend the riches of the abundance of the depth of the love and mercy of our God. That he would forgive our sins so that we could spend eternity with him. It does not make sense. So the first thing that Paul revealed in this verse is the riches. The second thing that Paul revealed is the glory. The glory. He said that God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory. Consider the amazement of this glory. Rich glory, this great, long-concealed truth. Long concealed. The meaning here is that the truth that the gospel was to be preached to all mankind was a truth abounding in glory. It is much like a magician. I don't, I don't know if y'all pay a whole lot of attention to magicians, but a magician has a way of concealing a trick until the last when he reveals it and everybody's caught off guard and everybody's amazed. That's the key. He holds the the reveal until the very end it has to do with a trick. God has no tricks of his sleep. There are no tricks. The reveal, there was a significance to this, to this reveal. When John says that God so loved the world, there is no fathomable way that a Gentile, Gentile that was never attached to God beforehand, just like a Jew. A Jew was, they, they were the people of God. A Gentile was a non-people of God. There's no way a Gentile would ever have understood that God loved them. When John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. They wouldn't see themselves in that verse. It just wouldn't make sense to them. But God loved every Gentile. The amazement of every Gentile who has ever tasted of the grace of God is that there is nothing that they can do but be amazed. When you taste of the grace of God, you don't have to go out and say, well, i got to pay back some. <laughs> no. There's nothing you can do but be amazed. That's what the hymn Amazing Grace is all about. We're amazed. He loves us. Such was the amaz <laughs> amazement, even to the height of the heavens. We're back to the package thing. We looked at the depth. Now we're going to look at the height. If you catch a mode of measurement, it's because the B modes are dealing with measurement. Listen to this verse that Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, 18 through 21, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints, here's the measurement, what is the depth and the height and the width and the length? To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? You don't have to understand it to receive it. That's how you know something that passes understanding. All you have to understand is trust. All you have to do is put your trust in Faith in God. You receive a love that you cannot explain or cannot comprehend. Back to that verse. To know the love of Christ which passes 
knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us, to him be glory, there's the word again, glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. See, we've, we've only covered up to this point the depth, and this is dealing with the height, but Paul goes to the next comparative element with the height to which our amazement is elevated to. There is no mode of comparison that could possibly reach the level of glory that the gospel imposes on our minds and our hearts. I think, I think if you and I could bottle the glory of God that came into our hearts at the moment we trusted in Christ, we'd have something that the whole world would want. They, they don't comprehend it. It doesn't make sense to them. But to us, we are still figuring it out, but it's by experience, not by wisdom. We are experiencing the love of God more every day. And the height of that love. It just here's how it does. Here's how we begin to understand it. It overflows. That's the height. This container can't hold it. It overflows. That's the height of the glory and the love of God inside of The riches and the glory. The third thing that Paul revealed here in this one verse is the mystery. He said that God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Now the A word I want to use in the A point, consider the absolution. The term absolution refers to the total release from the guilt that we all have inside of us when Jesus forgave us of our sins. The moment he forgave us, it's kind of like all that weight that we ever had on our shoulders, all the shame. You remember that shame? <laughs> My mom had this look. When I had done something wrong and I wondered if I had gotten away with it, I looked across the room at my mom, I knew I had it. Just like that. Saw that look on her face. We, we felt that guilt, but when God forgave us, it was gone. That's absolution. Consider this mystery. Paul proclaimed this Christ as being in them. For the design of the gospel is to put men in possession of the spirit and the power of Christ to make them partakers of the divine nature and to prepare them for an eternity spent in his presence. The Greek preposition, en, that's, that's en, en should be translated among because it amounts to the same. For Christ was among them to number one enlighten them number two quicken them number three purify them number four to refine them and this he could not do unless he dwelled in them pay close attention to the term quicken I don't know if you've ever used that word very much it has to do with the tax program I think quicken uh, but this quicken is something entirely different because it means to make alive. When you come to faith in Christ and he comes to live inside of you, you are quickened. You're made alive just like that. There's no denying it. So literally, the presence of the risen Christ comes to live inside of you and me the instant that we're born again. And the only way that can possibly, that can take place is to be completely forgiven and for Christ to be alive to come to live inside of you. That brings us to the measurement, the third measurement. We've dealt with depth and height. We're going to look at the breadth, the width of that measurement. The breadth brings us into consideration of how wide 
is the expanse of the grace of God to make it possible to include the Gentiles. You see, there were some issues in the New Testament. If you go all the way back to Genesis, the Gentiles were included back in Genesis because it came to all generations. That's impossible to say, well, just this group. You can trace the steps of God and the grace of God through the Old Testament all the way through the end of the Bible. For God so loved everybody. Everybody. That's the grace of God. Any and all sinners could be forgiven. Paul preached this present and indwelling Christ as the hope of glory. For no man could rationally hope for glory who had the pardon uh, who had not the pardon of his sins whose nature was not sanctified and no no one could have pardon but through the blood of his cross and none could be glorified except by the indwelling sanctifying spirit of Christ if this transition does not fully qualify as a glorious mystery, nothing ever will. It's a mystery. And the only way you can know the mystery is to know Christ. That's the only way it becomes real to you. The only way it became real for me. Now we've looked at, Paul talked about four measurements. The depth, the height, the width, and then he talked about the length got an illustration I think will explain the length. I've always liked uh, Paul Harvey's Now for the Rest of the Story. Y'all ever like those? This one was one of those. There was a Boston preacher Dr. J.D. Gordon who came in on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, and he set a beat up, bent rusted old birdcage beside the pulpit and then he told this story. <clears throat> An unkempt, unwashed little lad, about 10 years old, was coming up the alley swinging this old cage that he was pointing to. This old bird cage was several tiny birds shivering in the floor of it. The compassionate Dr. Gordon asked the boy where he got the birds. He said he trapped them. Dr. Gordon asked, what he was going to do with them. The boy said he was going to play with them and have fun with them. Then the preacher said, sooner or later, you're going to get tired of them. Then what are you going to do with them? And the lad said, I have some cats at home. They like birds. I'll feed them to the cats. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah. uh, Dr. Gordon said, son, how much do you want for the birds? The boy was a little surprised. He hesitated when he said, Mr. You don't want these birds. They're just plain old field birds. They can't sing and they're ugly. Preacher said again, just tell me how much do you want for the birds? The grubby little boy thought for a second. Then he squinted one little eye when he looked up at him and he calculated and said, two dollars? Kind of hesitated. The preacher said, sold. Reached in his pocket, pulled out two one dollar bills and handed them to boy and he handed him the cage and he ran off in a delight. Didn't have two dollars that morning, now he did. So he was happy as a lark. Now, Dr. Gordon walked around the corner, found a, a, a small alleyway between two buildings, and he opened the door of the cage, tapped the rusty exterior, encouraging the birds, and one at a time, they found their way through the narrow door and flew away. It's seven three. Now, ha having accounted for the empty cage sitting next to the pulpit, he told the rest of the story. Once upon a time, Jesus and the devil had engaged in a negotiation. Satan had boasted how he had baited a trap in garden in the Garden of Eden and it caught himself a whole tussle full of people. So 
Jesus asked, what are you going to do with all these people in your cage? The devil said, I'm going to play with them, tease them, make them marry and divorce and fight and kill one another. I'm going to have fun with them. Then Jesus said, you can't have fun with them forever. When you get tired of playing with them, what are you going to do with them? Satan said, I'll damn them. They're no good anyway. I'll condemn them to a devil's hell. He can go at that place. Though. I'll condemn them to a devil's hell. Jesus said, how much do you want from them? Satan said, you can't be serious. If I sell them to you, they're just going to spit on you. They'll hate you. They'll hit you and beat you. They'll drive nails through your hands and feet. They're no good. Jesus said, how much? Satan said, all of your tears and all of your blood. That's the price. You pay the price. That's what he said. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Our band's going to find their way in place. <clears throat> Just a moment, we're going to sing a song. Come to the altar. You know what? If you don't feel any better, there's no better time than right now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't have to do anything that would embarrass you. In fact, I would guarantee you, if you give your heart and life to Jesus today, this place will stand in the fall. That's the news that we all want to celebrate, and we all want to share, and we all want to have part in together. I'm not going to isolate you. I'm not going to do anything that would embarrass you except ask you to pray this simple prayer. And so that you don't have to be embarrassed to pray it out loud, I'm going to ask everybody to pray these words out loud. You've probably already prayed these words and already been saved, but you may be helping the person next to you express their faith in this Jesus. So I'm just going to ask everybody here to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. truth of Easter has just become real for the first time because there's life inside of you. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame. They're alive for us. I pray that right now they know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. That God today will be that day like for me, December 3rd, 1995, that they'll you became real to them today. 
kids up here. I'm going to ask a few of our deacons to be along the back wall. It may be easier to set to the back and just say, I, I need you to pray for me. But as we sing, and God's dealt with your heart. Mm -hmm.
encountered Jesus face to face and resurrected. Maybe for you singing a hallelujah. 